Forgive us for falling short. We thank you for your forgiveness. Now, God, it's time for the preach word. Lord, I ask you to rescue me from me. Hide me behind Jesus Christ. That the Holy Spirit will lead, guide, direct, and protect. Lord, bless us, Father God, to ring in our wandering mind. Bless us, Father God, that we will focus on you and your word. That your word will be real to us. That your word will saturate our hearts and our minds. That your word, Father God, will be priority in our lives. That we will run and tell men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness of your word. That they will taste and see how good God is. And glorify your name. It's in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus of Christ we come and we pray. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. God is such an awesome and such a great God. He has blessed us again and again and brought us to this point in our lives. Let me call your attention to St. John chapter 12. St. John chapter 12. For those of you who have been reading the, the Sunday school daily reading, you say, oh, I, I know this really well. Thank you for joining us tonight, or this morning, rather. St. John chapter 12, verses 23 through, 30, 23 through 25. The larger part of this pericope goes to 37. I want to read verses 23 through 25. St. John chapter 12, verses 23, 24, and 25. St. John chapter 12, 
verses 23, 24, and 25. You found it, you will discover these words. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for keep it for eternal life. I want to talk about die to live. Die to live. Die to live. Jesus speaks this hard saying in the text. It reminds me of a Christian comedian called Willie Moore Jr. Willie Moore Jr. tells a story about his little boy playing football. He says his son was horrible in football. Very few parents will admit it, but they jump on coaches because they won't play their son. But in all actuality, they have absolutely nothing to offer in the game. Willie, J, Willie Moore Jr. is very honest, and he talks about how horrible his son was in football. One night, Willie Moore Jr. had a dream. In his dream, he visualized his boy running the ball and made a touchdown. So on their way to the game the next morning, he, he said, man, I, I had a dream about you last night. And I dreamed that you ran the ball in for a touchdown. It was encouraging to this little boy. Because not only did his daddy know he was horrible, he knew he was horrible. He said, man, I, I dreamed last night that you got the ball and, and you sped toward the line of scrimmage and you ran in the end zone and people were jumping in the crowd and, and I was jumping and your mama was jumping, your brother was jumping and we were really celebrating the fact that you made a touchdown for the first time. So as they got to the game, this boy is pumped. He's excited. He's looking forward to that right moment. He played in the game. He ran 20 yards more than ever before with the ball without fumbling. He ran 20 yards, but he fell short of the touchdown line. He, he ran 20 yards, but time ran out. The fourth quarter was gone. On his way back home in the car, the daddy was saying, you know, boy, you really ran that ball today. You did a good job on the football field. And he looked behind him, and his boy was crying, cracking out tears. He said, man, why are you crying? Huh? Why are you crying? Because you did better than you ever done before. You did a good job on the field. You even broke a block, and you even broke a tackle. He said, but, Daddy, the reason why I'm crying is not because I dealt, I dealt so bad on the football field. Daddy, I just wanted to make your dream come true. Willie Moore Jr. says that it is our responsibility to make sure that God's dream for us comes true. Willie Moore Jr. declares to us today that he really dreamed this dream. He really believed this dream, but his dream didn't come true. The boy wasn't able to make his daddy's dream come true. The boy was broken. The boy was sad. He wasn't sad because he lost the game because he was used to losing games. He wasn't sad because he did so horribly on the field because he was used to doing horribly on the field. He only wanted his daddy's dream to come true. I submit to you this morning, will you make God's dream come true?
Will you make your daddy? Will you make the father? Will you make his dream come through in you? I submit to you today, if God's dream is going to be worked out in you, if God's dream for you is going to come true, then you're going to have to die to yourself in order to live for God. We got to die to some attitudes. We have to die to some things like self-centeredness. We got to give up the ghost to some things that, that keep pulling us back and pulling us down. And I submit to some of you today, you got to die to some folk in your life. That's right. That's right. There are some people that on your way to the top, they won't be able to go with you. There are some people as you move from one point to the other, they won't be glad to see you move. As long as you catch a metro, they're good with you. As long as you thumb and arrive, they're good with you. As long as they can help you out and, and help you live from one pillar to another post, they are good with you. As long as they can loan you a dollar, 50 cents, or a quarter, they are good with you. But you mess around and get your own job. And don't mention to drive your own car. Once you move out of the apartment into your house, um, she thinks she's something. And you say, everybody ain't able. We have to die to some people in our lives because they don't mean us the very best for ourselves. They'll say such things to you like this, girl, you living your best life now. Well, I live my best life now simply because I'm walking with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm living my best life now because I have made some sacrifices in the past that have catapulted me into my future. See, you can't do it all and then have it all later. I, I remember one night, one night, you know, I, I worked the graveyard shift, shift. And let me tell you, the graveyard shift, it will put you in your grave. I work, especially the shift I worked, I've worked three and sometimes four different shifts in one week. I worked from 3 to 11, 3 a.m. to 11 a.m., from 12 to 8, and, and from 11 to 3, 11 to 4. And let me tell you, the graveyard shift would throw your body off whack if you're not on a constant schedule. I worked the graveyard shift. I worked the graveyard shift. And see, the guy, the party didn't get started until 1030 at night. And so I knew I had to go in at 3 a.m. But the party didn't get started until 3 to 1030 at night. I knew, Sister Henry, I had to go in at 3 a.m. I knew I had it timed out right. We didn't have any Houston traffic. I could get up in 10 minutes, take a 10-minute shower, get out the shower, get on the road, and when I got on the road, I could be there in five minutes. I had a time not right. One morning, I walked in at 3 a.m. Miss Janie Simpson said to me, boy, you can't see it all. You can't get it all. You can't drink it all. And you can't party all. You might as well go home and go to sleep, get you some rest, so you can be fresh when you walk in here for your eight-hour shift. That spoke volumes in my life. What this woman was saying to me is, you have to sacrifice some things now in order to be at your best later. That's how it is in the text. In the text, Jesus is answering the question. The Greek shows up, and when the Greek shows up in verse number 29, the Greek shows up, and they are, they, have, they, have, they are among those who have come to see Jesus in his triumphant entry. The Greek shows up, and, and they come to worship and enjoy this feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Galilee. They come to Philip, and they ask him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. They tell, him, they tell him, how? The question is, how can we get to see Jesus? The question is, how can we follow Jesus? The Greek word see here doesn't mean to just focus your eyes on it. This word means to examine him, 
to be a part of him, to walk with him, to be his disciple. Let me just share with you, we are disciples of Christ and therefore we ought to act like Christ. So, so he comes to Philip. Philip comes to Andrew. And then Philip and Andrew goes to Jesus. Let me just tell you something, something about Andrew. Every time Andrew is mentioned, he's bringing somebody to Christ. He, he brings his brother Peter to Christ. He brings the lad when the 5,000 was fed. Andrew brings the lad to Christ. 5,000 men present, there's not enough food in the supermarket, it's too far for them to walk, and then they didn't have enough money. There was a lad there with some minnows and some biscuits. Andrew goes, and, and many of them say to Jesus, Jesus, we don't have enough to feed 5,000 people. Andrew had enough sense to take it to Jesus. Right. It says to us this morning, it says to us this morning, when you don't have enough, take it to Jesus. Andrew takes the lad to Jesus, and when he took the lad to Jesus, Jesus multiplied, and they had food enough for 5,000 men, not to mention children, and leftovers. Every time Andrew is mentioned, he's bringing somebody to Jesus, and in the text, Andrew and Philip goes to Jesus. Jesus answers the question. Verse 23, it says, but Jesus answered them, saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man shall be glorified. You see, Jesus had already told them, my time is not yet. It's not time for me to die yet. You know, Peter tried to get Jesus killed in a midnight brawl. Let me tell you, when you got ghetto friends, they'll get you killed in the ghetto. Peter, Peter walks up. This, this man walks up to arrest Jesus. Peter pulls his sword out. Cuts off Machach's ear. Jesus leans down, picks up Machach's ear, pins it back on the side of his head, and tells Peter, put up your sword. What Peter, what Peter didn't understand at the time was God had already worked it out for him. And he's trying to get him killed in a late night brawl when God has already worked out for him to be killed on Calvary's hill. Let me tell you, there's some people you need to get rid of. Ghettoism, get rid of it. It doesn't matter if you're born in the ghetto, reared in the ghetto, raised in the ghetto, played in the ghetto, spent time in the ghetto. Sometimes you got to get rid of ghetto mentality. And in order for us to get rid of ghetto mentality, we got to get rid of the ghetto folk. And I'm not judging, I'm not judging. I mean, I, I spent my time in the ghetto. I, I spent my time with ghetto people. But if you're going to die to live for Jesus, then you got to get rid of some folk that mean nothing in your life. They always tell you, I remember I had this monkey suit on in Jackson, Mississippi. I was working at Burger King, and they had a big old ugly suit. They had stripes this big going vertically down. It was yellow, brown, and orange stripes. And I would walk up and down those hills going to, going to, to work, and there were guys sitting on the sideline and under the tree swapping lies and sharing a bottle. And they would say, hey, little brother, where you going? I said, man, I'm going to work. He said, man, if I was you, I wouldn't go. I would sit under this tree with us. I said to them, even as a teenager, I said to them, the reason why you're sitting under the tree now is because you didn't do what you're supposed to have done when you were my age. I kept right on going. Some people were embarrassed to wear that suit. Man, I wore it with pride. <laughs> I, I, I would with pride. And then when I got to Burger King, I was one of the drill, the drill masters. And, and I knew how to flip a burger. I mean, I could flip it and go up down. And I know which side it's going to hold up on. Let me tell you, we have to take pride in an honest day's work and not trying to get rich quick. We got to tell our children. We got to tell our children that, that it doesn't matter where you work. It's a matter of having an honest day's work. We need to make sure that we do what is best for our children to see us doing what's best. And therefore, we got to get rid of some folk around us. All right. That's right. We, have to, we have to die to ourselves. Die to our interests. Jesus says it's time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Many see death as humiliation. Many see death as a downward spiral. 
But Jesus sees death as an opportunity to be glorified. Now, for those of you who are on the brink of suicide, let me just say to you, he's not talking about physical death. He's, he's not talking about killing yourself. He's not talking about taking your life. What he's saying is give your life to Jesus, and Jesus can do more with your life than you can do. And Jesus says it's time to be glorified. You see, in order for Jesus to be glorified, let me just share with you, he had to die. Therefore, spiritually, we've got to die to some things. We have to die to our idols. We have to die to some idol things. Are there any idols in your life? Are there some things? Are there some places? Are there some people that you'd rather be with than be with God? We have to die. We have to die to our very own interests. Some of us need to die to our dreams. If your dreams do not include God, you need to die to those dreams. Some of us need to die to our plans. Some of us need to die to our focus. Some of us need to die to our goals. Did you set your goals without God? You know, people are good, especially around December. We're good at making goals. We, we, want, we want New Year's resolutions to be prevalent. And those New Year's resolutions that you set in December, by January 15th, they're gone. If you don't factor God into your dreams, if you don't factor God into your goals, then they will slip away from you. We need to doubt our money. The Bible teaches that a fool and his money will soon depart. One who does not trust Christ, one who does not love the Lord, one who does not depend on him, it doesn't matter how much money you have. Last check, the average person who won the lotto was broke by Three years. I mean, and some of them were dead because money just ran them crazy. A fool and his money will soon depart. That's why, men, we can't be workaholics until we don't enjoy the great pleasures of familyhood. Family life is so important. That's why some jobs now want you to have a good work-life balance because they don't want you to come in there all disturbed. All off balance. All mentally deranged. They want you to have a good work-life balance. And so we got to turn our back and die to some things we love. We have to turn our back and die to some things that we are concerned about. We got to move away from self-centeredness. It's all about me. If you're going through, how many people are going through this morning? If you're going through now, the best thing you can do is bless somebody else as you go through. If you want God to bless you now, you need to be blessing somebody else as you go through. That's why when God talks about fasting, it says you don't eat these foods, but you buy it for your neighbors and you take your neighbors some. Yeah, when you go to the grocery store, if you're in the midst of your fasting, and, and, and we're about coming up on that time very soon, if you're in the midst of your fasting and you're rolling by some meat that we don't eat right then and there, you ought to get you some meat and throw it in the basket for your neighbors, for your friends, for your foes, for your enemies. You ought to be blessing somebody else as you're going through. Whatever you're going through now, you ought to make sure that somebody else gets the message that you want to bless them. You know how many times I've, I've come and I've preached to you about life's issues, and I had my own issues. I know y'all thought I was as pure as the driven snow. Everybody but Sister Paul, she reminds me every chance she gets. <laughs> You ain't got it going on. But, but you know, we have to get to a point in our lives where we understand, we understand that it's not about us. It's not about who we are or what we have or what we're going to have because all this stuff is temporary. And because it's temporary, you need to wear this world like a loose garment because one of these days you're going to have to give it up. I mean... I, I, I know everybody in the room, everybody in the room, everybody that's listening to me, I know your 401k has taken a hit. And it, it, didn't, go, it, didn't, it didn't go like this, Sister Whitlock. It went like that. 
I mean, it has nothing. We, we have nothing on the blue bunny plague when it comes to diseases. We are, in, we are in a bad shape. We got disease running rampant. We got mad men running rampant that will shoot up little innocent children. We have, we have people that will, will, will push a, a lie for 20 years and watch people die in the midst of it. And then we will put him back in there again. I mean, two time impeached. And people still running behind him. We just love this man. You have to die to some things that, that you like. Some things that you love. Some things that you've been dealing with. And I'm telling you today, you need to even die to your relaxation. I mean, some people got to the point where they're just chilling. I mean, I'm just chilling. I... I've been waiting all my life just to chill. You have to understand that somebody needs you. Somebody needs you, your blessing. Somebody needs your comforting. Somebody needs your instruction. When you get to be a senior, you ought not just sit down, fold your hands, and say, I made it. Some young girl, some young boy needs your instructions so they can be blessed by your knowledge. And don't go to them as if you never made a mistake. Tell the truth and tell them how you messed up and, and tell them how you went up food hill. Tell them how you struggled through your life so they can know that they are not by themselves. Amen. We have to get to a point in our lives where we forsake some things for the love of God. We have to get to a point in our lives where, where we turn away on some things, some habits. We have to turn away from our sleep habits. Sleep habits. I mean, if you getting ten hours of sleep, you te you sleeping too long. I mean, if you if you if you can sleep, snore and slobber for ten whole hours every day, there's something wrong with you. You got to go get checked. If if you can be in the midst of a conversation and you just lay down, you go get checked. If you can be so in tune with your sleep habit until you can't hold a decent conversation, can't even sit in the midst of a church service without finishing up your night's sleep. <laughs> Not at this church, but at a church down the street, around the corner, there are some folk that walk in the room and say, ooh, it sure is pleasant in here. And it's over. If you're sleeping 10 hours a day, you, you're spending too much time in relaxation. The world is going forward. The world is going on. You ought to be applying yourself to stuff that will be fruitful for the kingdom. It's a sacrifice. Get your priorities in order. Oh, yeah, we, we in church, we can talk about it. Oh, God first, then family, then self, then work, then children. We, we got our, our pecking order. But is God really first in your life? Is God really the one you're following? Is God the one that you are willing to die on behalf? Or is you just, are you just making statements on are you just saying what church folks say? Some of us need to die to our families. Uh oh. I know that's right, there are people. There are people at churches because their family came up in this church. There are people who who live in the same neighborhood because this was us's house. And there are people who are trying to hold on to stuff that is no longer yours, including people. Young women, you don't want young boys. You don't want anybody that don't want you. Let me tell you, there's a way to say, uh, I'll read it you. <laughs> there's a way to say goodbye. There's a way to say see you later. There's a way to say God bless your whole heap of plenty. So we have to turn away even from our timelines. You know, we, we, we've heard a lot of, of preachers and speakers and motivators say, you can have it right now, but don't you know that God has the ultimate timeline? 
And yes, we ought to pray. We ought to bombard heaven for what we want. And we ought to ask God for what we want. But when God doesn't deliver when we want to deliver, we have to de abandon our timeline, reassess things, and say, God, I'm coming to you. I'm trusting you. That's what Jesus says in, in John 12, 23 through 25. Jesus has come and has given of himself. He has come to be glorified, and he understands in order for me to be glorified, I have to die. He gives this analogy. He says, most assured, assuredly, I say to you, unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. If a grain of wheat does not go into the ground and die, then that grain of wheat will never be anything other than a grain of wheat. Unless it dies, unless it gives up the ghost. If it doesn't die, then it will never grow and never be multiplied and it will never bear fruit. I just stopped by on my way to the rapture to let you know you got to die to some things and die to some places and die to some people. Because you'll represent that grain of wheat, and if this grain of wheat does not go into the ground and die, it will not come up. Growing up on a plantation, I, I, just, I just saw it so vividly. We would take five little grains and put them in the, in the ground, and we would just wait for them to die. We would just water them and and they had to, to die to germinate. They had to die to make a plant. And those five little peas, after it is dead, after it has gone through germination, after it has come to the point where we watered it and it absorbed in the ground, it gives us a whole bushel. That's how Jesus says our lives, our lives are when we die to ourselves. I want you to think of ten things that's so precious to you that you need to let go. Whether it's your attitude, whether it's people, whether it's your schedule, just think of 10 things that you need to let go, 10 things that you need to die to, and then think of another 10 things that you need to use what God has given you in order to bless other people. What is it? Well, you all say I can't sing, so I I've come to the conclusion I can't bless you through my singing. But let me tell you, riding down 16, I'm blessing myself. Oh, I get excited. Sister Hughes, you just don't know. You can't keep up with me on the organ riding down 16. I know how to bless myself. I know how to bless the Lord. And let me tell you, the guy sitting next to me knows I'm talking to the Lord. That's why, that's why it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much for me to be excited. All I have to do is think about, think about what I used to do. Think about where I used to be. Think about what has happened in my life. And my soul cries out, hallelujah to the Lamb, because God did it one more time. God did it. So just think about 10 things that, that you need to turn loose. You say, Pastor, that's a lot, right? Yeah, that's, that's the first thing. You need to turn loose your, your attitude to thinking that you're more than who you are. Thinking you got it going on and you can't find 10 things. Let me tell you, if you keep probing, you can find 25. Find 10 things, 10 things that, that you can let go of that will bring you closer to the Lord, closer to your family, and closer to your enemies. Because God, God wants us to turn loose some things. God wants us to do some things that are different. God doesn't want us to get up every morning and go through the same routine over and over again. Get up, do what we do, go back to sleep. Go to sleep, wake up in the morning, do the same old routine. There's more to life than what you're doing. You have to be aggressively seeking God and allowing him to show it to you. It says unless the wheat goes into the ground... Unless a grain of wheat goes into the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain, much wheat, much fruit. Do you want to live your life in mediocrity? Yeah, keep doing what you're doing. If you want to live life in mediocrity, just keep doing what you're doing. 
Just handling and, and proving to yourself, oh, I really got it going on. I'm all right. Things are not as bad as people see they are. Because I don't see what they see. That's the problem with a narcissist right there. He or she does not see what everybody else sees. One woman was looking out the window. And every day she looked out the window. She said, now that woman hanging up them dirty clothes. On the clothesline. For y'all, you, you all who are, who are under 50, uh, I want to tell you, sometimes we used to hang clothes on the clothesline, and it's usually in the backyard, and we would hang them on the clothesline, and the sun would dry them through the natural process. So this woman looking out the window, she said, baby, I'm sick and tired of that woman hanging those dirty clothes on that line. She didn't do a good job of washing those clothes. She talking to her husband. And her husband didn't say a mumbling word. After the third day of her watching, of her watching this woman hang her clothes on the line, and she's talking about how dirty the clothes are, the husband wipes up, takes a towel and wipes the window in front of her, and then she can see crystal clear. It was nothing wrong with the woman's clothes. It was something wrong with the window in which she was looking out of. And because she was looking out a dirty window, she thought the woman's clothes were dirty. We can always see somebody else's dirt. Somebody may be sitting here now. I'm going to take this message to somebody else. No, don't take it to anybody else. Take it to yourself and sit it there and munch on it and chew on it because there's some dirt in all of our lives. I told you, I told you, when you walk by faith, when you walk by faith, you, you put your life into somebody else's life. When you're waiting on a blessing, whatever you're not blessed with, always give it to somebody else. I remember the days when, when New Beginning couldn't rub two quarters together. You'll get that when you get home. I remember the days when our budget didn't match up. And whenever it got scared, Deacon, Deacon, Deacon Roberts would come to me and say, well, Pastor, we didn't meet budget this year. Or we didn't meet budget this week. I said, okay, write a $100 check to this church. He said, I guess you didn't understand me. So I said, well, since you didn't understand me, write another check to this church. And then he come back and said, I said we didn't meet. And you asked me to write another. I said, yeah, why you had to write a third check to this church? And after going through that three and four years and how God just showered blessings down on us, we didn't have any more members, we didn't have any more givers, but God had touched the hearts of other people and we have never gone without whatever God would want us to have. God has always blessed us in spite of us. You got to keep on giving. One guy finally, finally caught it. He was a preacher. He finally caught it. He said, oh, now I see. Pastor is trying to give him his way out of debt. I said, well, you better catch on. And you better catch on at your house as well as at the church. Because this church is going to keep on moving. Regardless of what the economy does, we're going to keep moving because we got seed in the ground. And because we got seed in the ground, the seed is going to keep coming up. And when it comes up, it's going to produce much. Year after year, whenever something happens, God touches the heart of somebody. They keep right on giving. Year after year, you think you think you think forty one thousand dollars of damage to our electric system was too big for God. And let me tell you, insurance still hadn't paid completely off. And guess what? God touched the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls. He touched their hearts, and, and we still don't want for anything. Let me tell you, when you bless the Lord and you bless others, God is able to make men bless you. The Bible teaches that he will give you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will he call men to give to you? He will bless you. He will bless you in spite of all that the enemy tries. It is our responsibility to keep talking about God. It is our responsibility, regardless of if we're in this building or in a gymnasium across town, it is our responsibility to keep telling men, women, boys, and girls that on a skull hill called Calvary, Jesus gave it up all for us. And all to him we owe. So when this seed dies, it produces much grain. Verse number 25. He who lives, who, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates 
his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. He's not saying dislike yourself. It doesn't, it doesn't say commit suicide. It doesn't say take your life. What it says is that if you love your life in the world you live in, some people have come to the conclusion that they love the life they're living. I'm living my best life. I'm living the life I live, and I'm on top of the world. Don't you know that the songwriter was saying, I, I went in, I got in bed on top of the world, and I woke up, and the world was on top of me. All it takes is one incident. All it takes is one lie. All it takes is one situation, and our whole world will be turned upside down. We can't brag about what we have. We can't brag about how holy we are. We can't brag about what we've done because the pressure, the squeeze is on all of us. And whenever you squeeze a lemon, lemon juice comes out. You can always tell those who have spent quality time in the Lord, when things go, round or go wrong, what comes out? I mean, I've, I've heard some members just speak in flat tongues. And they weren't other tongues either. They weren't cloven tongues either. They have some short words and they have some long words. And it just comes out when they're under pressure, when you're under pressure, when the squeeze is on, the, the juice just comes out. It says to us, whatever is in us will come out of us. Whatever is in us, we have to make sure we put the right things in us. Our children are so impressionable. Young people are committing suicide like never before. Over simple stuff. Over not getting enough likes. Over mama told me to wash the dishes so I'm leaving. Over somebody telling them, oh, you ought to take, somebody tells him, a little girl tells him he, ought to, he takes his life. It is our responsibility as the church to make sure that we pump out eternal life. It's our responsibility as men, women, boys, and girls to tell people about the Jesus who saves. People, people who love Jesus don't shoot up the place. Children who love Jesus, they don't just get caught up with any and everything. Children who, who love Jesus, you need to make sure... Sunday school is available. Uh, worship service is available. Bible study is available. If we need Jesus after they get in a bad situation, we need Jesus before we get in a bad situation. We need Jesus. And we ought to get off this thing. I grew up in Sunday school, so I don't want my child to grow up and stuff. I had church every day. Well, we ain't asking your child. We're asking you and your child to give the Lord five hours a week out of, well, most of the time it's three hours, five hours a week out of 168 hours. Because guess what? When you get in a bad situation, you're going to need Jesus. When you, get, when you get in a fix, you, you're going to need Jesus. In the last three years, I've preached more funerals for non-members who are not in anybody's church than I ever had. I mean, they just, well, I just left because the pastor made me mad. What church you belong to? I, I, you know, I ain't been going. And then they try to make it sophisticated. They try to justify it. And then they try to make me feel like, I mean, this is the time, this is the time, Sister Regina, this is the time I feel like they, they, they want me to think it's raining when they tt on my leg. <laughs> well, well I, can't, I can't go to church because COVID is out there. But COVID is at Kroger's. Kroger, Kroger's, uh, COVID is, is, is outside. Kroger's is inside. I can't, I can't go to church. And they act like, Brother Carter, they act like we manufacturing COVID-19 at the church. They act like I'm standing at the first front door giving them a glass and say, drink it now. But I was at Walmart the other day. Very few masks and folk are jam-packed in there. I saw Trader Truth concert the other day. 
celebrities from all over the world. And whenever there are celebrities, young folk just flock. I mean, it, people are packed in this little square footage of area. They just on top of each other. But none of them showed up at church this morning. I just want to serve notice, we are not manufacturing COVID-19 at the New Beginning Church. You all can come on back now. Matter of fact, we are taking precautions. You can come on back now. We have to get our priorities in check. And if you don't like the preacher, I just want to serve you notice that, that uh, that's, that's a gone, gone by excuse because the bottom line is we like the preacher when the baby is born and we bring him to him to, to get him blessed. I bless more babies that didn't belong to New Beginning than I have blessed babies that belong to New Beginning. We don't like the preacher, so, but we bring to him because we want him to bless our baby because we believe that this preacher that we don't like can get a prayer through. And this, check this out. Sister Henry, they want me to pray for this child one time so I can pray their blessings for the rest of their lives. We don't like the preacher, but the preacher is the first one that blessed them coming in. And guess what? Sister Russell, he's the last one that blessed them on the way out. I mean, they, they, they may not even want, they, they say stuff like, I don't want to have the funeral at the church because he did not go to church, but I want the preacher to do it. And they forget that the preacher at the cemetery has the last word, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, looking forward to the general resurrection where Jesus will crack the sky at the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall ride first. Now they got to hear from the preacher anyway. We have to get to a point where we get away from foolishness and watch what God does and on our behalf. We got to abandon stuff. We have to abandon ourselves. And then he says, finally, this life that you live in this world, you got to give it up. <laughs> you might as well begin to hate this life. I mean, all your stuff is going to rust away. All of your stuff, moths are going to eat them. All your stuff is going to die in the fire. God said it won't be water, but fire the next time. And if you're going to be on the first trip out of here with me, if you're going to be on the first trip out of here, you don't care about your stuff. So you need to act like you don't care about your stuff now. Yeah, we ought to take care of whatever God gives us. We ought to clean it. We ought, we ought to keep it up. Because we need to know that God has blessed us and we need to show others that God has blessed us. But when you put your stuff in this world before your eternal life, you are messed up. So he says, you got to put away this stuff, hate this stuff. Then you can have eternal life. You see, eternal life is a sacrificial life. Eternal life is a life that we, we have when we connect with Jesus Christ. Eternal, those who have eternal life, you don't have to beg them to worship. You don't have to beg them to serve. Those who have eternal life, God has manifested himself to them, and they are, they are eager to serve. They, they're excited about serving. And then when they serve, they don't turn their lips up like they just ate some simmons. Green Simmons. I mean, one thing about the First Impressions ministry, and, and business, you can tell me if, it, if it's not true. I believe our First Impressions ministry have a smile at the front door. I believe our First Impressions ministry have, have, have a smile when they usher you to your seat. I even believe when you give our First Impressions ministry a hard time, and folks do that in church, I believe they say, well, how can I serve you with a smile? I can't tell you what they're thinking, but I believe they smile. When you say to them, but I don't want to sit here, and you sit in the next way, I believe our first impression ministry love the Lord and so saved that they are eager to serve, and they are saying to you, wherever you want to sit. And I believe I'm correct. We have to get to a point where we die in order to live. Die to stuff. The worst thing that any church member can say, we've never done it that way. 
Oh, we've always done it this way. Die to tradition. You know, now, you know, one thing when I, when I, I designed this building, I wanted to make sure that we didn't put, build a pulpit with, with four small chairs and one high chair in the middle. I wanted to make sure when we built, built this podium, this pulpit, it was a stage. And so now you see everybody in the room, men, women, boys, and girls, are children, and they come to stand behind what is known as the sacred desk of authority because it's not a pulpit until the preacher stands in the pulpit. It's a stage where everybody can come and talk about the goodness of God because it is a stage. But now that I'm preaching, it's a pulpit. And it's the job of the preacher to pull those who sit in the pews out of the pit. And therefore, it becomes the pulpit. And when the preacher preached, you see, Ashton Jones and I planted the Bible right there. And our prayer was that God, that whenever somebody stands in this place, that they will speak the word of God, the unadulterated word of God. And if they choose not to, make sure that people won't hear them. And then they won't be back ever again. Because this is a, a sacred place. This is a place where lives are changed, where lives are renewed, and eternal life is dished out. Yes, yes. Jesus says in this pericope that you got to give up this world. Hate your life in this world. I said to you, think of ten things that you've got to get rid of in order to be excellent for God. We serve an excellent God, and we ought to give him excellent service. We serve an excellent God, and we ought to give God our very best. We serve an excellent God, and we ought to make sure that we pull our brothers and sisters out of the pit by telling them how excellent a God we serve. And when he talks about eternal life, Jesus is saying that I had to give up this world. He says that over 2,000 years ago, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. He died on the Skull Hill called Calvary. Mean men hung him high. Mean men stretched him wide. Mean men lifted him up. And for those same mean men, he died. They took him off the cross, laid him in a barber tomb. It was a barber tomb because it didn't need it too long. Early that third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. He died so he can live. That same Jesus is living right now. On the right hand of the Father, he's making intercessions for you and for me. Every time we mess up, we confess our sin. We get another chance because we confess it. He's making intercessions for us. Yeah, he died, but he yet lives. Die to yourself so he can continue to live in you. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus. Just as you are. Bring all your stuff. Bring all your troubles. Bring all your trials. Bring it to Jesus. He is the author and the finish of our faith. You tried her, you tried him. You've tried them, you've tried it. I recommend Jesus. The conquering king of Calvary. Jesus himself. He will make it right. We never know when we're going to die. We never know when we breathe our last breath. But you need to have Jesus. You can't afford to die without him. The door is open. The invitation is extended. Try Jesus. You can try him right now. Regardless of where you are, regardless of what you're doing, regardless of what you have done. Try Jesus. He makes a way out of no way. We ought to be telling men, women, boys, and girls about Jesus the Christ and all he has done. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We pray, Father God, that men will learn to die to the things of this world in order to live for you. 
In Jesus' name we pray. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment. Just repeat this simple prayer after me and invite him into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, and thank God. When we thank God for who he is and what he's already done, we serve the awesome and the amazing God. He has blessed us one more again. Hallelujah to the Lamb. God, the God we serve is such an awesome and such an amazing God. And yes, we have to die in order to fully live. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial giving. It's time to give to the Lord. Hallelujah. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand. We have a white and blue envelope for tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts, and a white and red envelope for a pastor's love offering. Please raise your hand and you will be served. If you want to give electronically, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail your offering, your gifts in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for this privilege of giving. We thank you for money. We thank you for income. We thank you for increase. We thank you for every person that will give unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to ask this side to stand. Follow first impressions from the rear to the front. Bring forth the Lord's tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. Great things. Decide to stand from the first presence from the rear to the front. Bring forth the Lord's tithes, offering, and sacrifice. our visitors with us. Say hello to us visitors. Amen. Thank you for visiting with us. I'm going to ask Sister Davis to come for a presentation.
We're gonna give her a chance to come forth. I know she's giving her husband the eye. <laughs> We're giving her this award for her diligent commitment to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and her great dedication to the development of the ministry and people, turning hearts toward God. 2 Chronicles 16 and 9, Acts 1 and 8, July 22, 2022. Mars Hill Hutchinson is the executive director and Matthew and Davis is the founding president. <laughs> Listen to me, man. <laughs> Marry that woman, man. <laughs> Amen. Is it December 23, right? Yes, sir. December 23, they will be uh, in holy matrimony. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sister Mitchell. Thank you for participating with us. And she's she's not a part of Turning Heart. She's not a part of the New Beginning Church. But she has sought out food and stuff for our young people. And, and as you know, because of COVID, we had to cancel the count the very last minute. And we used to have 72, 75 students filled and packed in this building. And so we thank God for, for her efforts and her opportunity. And all she had to do is say, this is for me. Meaning, this is for her. And because she has those connections, they just start giving up stuff. When I get grown, I'm gonna be like that. Call people and say, do this for me. Amen. So thank you so much. That's right. And usually, usually you need a month in advance. She talked about 24 hours in advance. And so we appreciate, we appreciate uh, your contact and what you have, have done for our students. Amen. Amen. I have another church service that started at 11 o'clock. So I told the pastor I'll be there very soon. And so if there is nothing else, I'm going to need the council to uh, call this, this meeting to a close and uh, so I can get on down the road in Sunnyside, Texas. Amen. Everybody's saying, yeah, we're fanning. Get us out of here. Let us stand. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. God bless you and God keep you. Father God, we thank you. We bless your name. We thank you, Father God, for your commitment to us. Now, Lord, bless us to be committed to you. Lord, bless us, Father God, that we will walk with you and that we will always point men, boys, and girls to you, Father God. We ask you to bless us in our going. We dismiss ourselves and ask you to dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. We ask you to walk with us. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him, the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. God bless you.